Hello Health on LAE is presented by the Oxner Health System, a nonprofit academic multi specialty healthcare delivery system dedicated to patient care, research, and education. The Oxner Health System includes eight hospitals and 38 health centers located throughout Southeast Louisiana. Oxner, healthcare with peace of mind. We call it our more money to spoil our grandkids plan. With a Humana Medicare Advantage Health Plan, we get tips on how to make our money go further. We even get a health finance and benefits statement called Smart Summary that helps us find even more ways to save. And we like more. More of what you want because you deserve more. Hi, I'm Tom Bagwill and welcome to Hello Health, a partnership with WLAE, the Oxner Health System and Humana to bring Oxner's Hello Health weekly education and information series to television. Tonight's topic, celiac disease, a disorder of the digestive system that impacts children and in some care, children and, and adults too. And we have two guests tonight, gastroenterologist Arna Bray is here and registered dietitian Molly Kimball is back with us on the program. In the second half hour of our show, we'll be taking your questions questions live by phone at 504-866-3200. That's 866-3200. And by email, just email your questions to us at hhquestions at wlae.com. Well, Molly Kimball earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Dietetics and a Bachelor of Science degree in Food Science from Louisiana State University, LSU. She completed her dietetic internship at Touro Hospitals in New Orleans in 1999. Molly Kimball is board certified as a specialist in sports dietetics and today serves as the Nutrition Program Manager at Oxner's Elmwood Fitness Center. She has a weekly segment on WGNO-TV called Get the Skinny with Molly. You can also read her nutrition column in the Times Picayune. Dr. Arna Bray attended medical school at LSU in New Orleans. He did his residency work at Vanderbilt. His fellowship in gastroenterology is from the Oxner Health System. He is uh, certified by both the American Board of Gastroenterology and the American Board of Internal Medicine. And it is our pleasure to welcome to the program Dr. Arna Bray for the first time and Molly Kimball for I think the third or fourth time. Great to have you both yeah. with us on the program. Molly, Thank good to have you back. Us. You're yeah. very welcome. And Dr. Ray, good to have you. Good to see you, Tom. Dr. Ray, what was it, we ask all our first time guests, what was it or who was it that first got you interested in, in medicine? Medicine. Well, Tom, thanks for asking. My, par my parents came to this country from India uh, to follow the American dream, and when I was growing up, I was under the assumption that the only uh, jobs you could get were either being a lawyer, a doctor, or an engineer. And uh, as I was trying to decide between being a doctor or an engineer, I did some medical research at LSU under Dr. James Hill, and he really pushed me in the direction of, uh, of uh, medicine. and. Uh, really showed me that this is what I was meant to do. And uh, as I uh, pursued it more, I realized it was uh, what I wanted to do. And how about in this area of special uh, specialty gastroenterology? So during medical school, uh, I was able to actually watch a colonoscopy, and while most people might be turned off by that particular procedure, I was really fascinated by it and how you could make diagnoses that way and, uh, and actually prevent cancer such as colon cancer. So. Uh, once I saw that, I was hooked. Well, and at 51, I mentioned to you, maybe I'll be seeing you uh, from a different perspective uh, here shortly. I know <laughs> 50 is, is the age, and you said you've been there a couple of times yeah. already, right? Yeah, it's not bad, you know. It's, it's, I mean, nobody loves it, but, you know, I've, I've had two 
and it's, you know, you just do it. It's part of taking care of yourself. Right. For the record, Molly's nowhere near 50, <laughs> uh, but, but has, a, has a history, right? Right. Uh, right. A family right. history, right? So we want to be on the safe side. Well, we'll get to Molly in just a moment as we talk about gluten free foods and labels. Uh, she's a real specialist in this area, and we look forward to that. But, Doctor, let's begin with some background. What is uh, celiac disease? So celiac disease is an inflammatory condition of the small intestine, and it usually happens after ingesting gluten. And it's typically found in uh, people who have a genetic predisposition to this inflammatory reaction. Now, celiac disease is also known as gluten-sensitive enteropathy, sprue, or non-tropical sprue. Okay. And we talked about it affecting adults and, and children, um, and I was asking you how many people are impacted by this, and I think that it's 1% or less than 1%, but, but Molly quickly pointed out you may not be, uh, have celiac disease, but there are a lot of people with uh, gluten sensitivity, a lot more people involved in that, right? Maybe up to 10% of the population. Absolutely. So, so we think it's about 1 in 140 Americans who have celiac disease, but we're starting to learn that there is a difference between celiac disease and just gluten sensitivity. So you may not have all the positive tests for celiac disease, but still be extremely sensitive to gluten. And when you take gluten out of your diet, you find out that you're feeling much better. And so as we learn more and more about this, and as more people start trying these gluten-free diets, we're starting to find that this is a very common problem. Do most people who start off as gluten sensitive end up with celiac disease or not necessarily? Not necessarily, not necessarily. I think you have to really do the testing, which we'll talk about in just a little bit, to confirm that you're actually one of those people who has celiac disease. Okay, we've used the term gluten a couple of times tonight. Exactly what is gluten? That's a good question. So gluten is actually the protein component of foods processed from wheat, barley, and rye. And it's commonly added to foods like soy sauce, ice cream, and ketchup. Uh, but the classic things that we think about are your breads and your pastas. And gluten, uh, to put it into practical terms, is what gives food its texture and its elasticity. So when you're eating that po' boy and you're biting into the bread and you're enjoying how good it feels, uh, gluten is what gives it its chewiness. Okay. Who gets celiac disease? So celiac disease can be found in almost anybody. But like I said, you have to have the genetic predisposition to, uh, to get it. It's uh, found between 1 in 100 to 1 in 300 people, but it's mostly seen in whites of northern and western European descent. It can also be seen in people from India, South America, North Africa, and it's a little bit more rare uh, in Africans, Caribbeans, and Chinese, and Japanese. And it can be in both men and women but we find it slightly more common in women. Okay. Um, what are the symptoms of celiac disease? So this is a very common question, and it's a lot more complicated than it seems. Some people might not have any symptoms at all from celiac disease, and you have to be suspicious from some of the lab, lab work or other signs to look for it. But classically, we see celiac disease patients having diarrhea, abdominal pain, distension, or gas, unexplained weight loss, or sometimes even constipation. So as you can see, it runs the whole gamut of symptoms between diarrhea and constipation. But what I tell most people is if you've ever been diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome, which covers a lot of these symptoms, you need to make sure that it's not celiac disease and get tested. Um, if no symptoms, you said some people have it and don't have symptoms, um, is there a need to worry? And we'll talk about treatment options later. but. Well, I would say if you're in good health and you're not having any symptoms and all of your lab work looks okay, then you probably don't need to worry. And if you can eat most foods without any problems, it's okay. But if you have had some other uh, abnormal blood work or uh, something that your doctors mentioned to you, uh, then you may need to think about celiac disease. And uh, some of those other signs are weak bones or osteoporosis, uh, anemia, that can't be explained by other reasons. If you've had problems conceiving a child or had uh, multiple miscarriages, you may want to think about being tested for celiac disease. And then it can be something just as simple as uh, dermatitis, rashes, or uh, alopecia, a problem with balding. And then finally, 
if you've just noted on your blood work that your liver enzymes have been elevated, but you're feeling fine and don't have any other explanation, you also may want to think about getting tested for celiac disease. One symptom we didn't talk about, but we'll show people a little lighter, is skin rashes, right? That's right. And in with, with celiac disease, there's actually one very classic skin rash that goes along with it, and it's called dermatitis herpetiformis. And this skin rash has a very classic appearance to it, it is kind of blistery and bubbly. It's typically found on your extensor surfaces, and by that I mean your elbows, your knees, the back of your neck, and it can also be found on your butt. And it's uh, typically very itchy, so if you've got it, you know it. <laughs> and uh, if you see a dermatologist, uh, they may tell you, this is dermatitis herpetiformis. You need to go see a gastroenterologist and get tested for celiac disease. For the record, the, the, the doctor did ask for permission to use the term butt, <laughs> and we, uh, Molly and I both encouraged it. So, uh, <laughs> Dr. Ray, uh, well done. And we're going to show you what that uh, looks like a little later in the program. What is the testing process for celiac disease? So there are actually a lot of tests available for celiac disease, and it's not too hard to do. If you go to your primary care physician or a gastroenterologist, they can typically run some very simple blood tests to check for celiac disease if there is a suspicion. Uh, and these are typically antibody tests. And the most common one that we use now is something called a TTG, or a tissue transglutaminase. There's also an anti-endomesial antibody, an anti-gliadin antibody, and they also need to check something called an IgA level. Uh, the long term for that is immunoglobulin A. And the reason for that is because some people are deficient in this uh, immunoglobulin. And if so, you need to check some additional tests to confirm that you've got celiac disease. And I need to uh, add here, it's very important that when you are getting tested for celiac disease, you actually need to be eating gluten because that's what causes the inflammatory reaction in your body and that's what we're testing for when we check these blood tests. So if you've been checked for celiac disease in the past but you were already on a gluten-free diet, those tests really aren't very good. So that's important to make sure uh, with your doctor. Okay. Molly, I didn't think I would ask you this question and I didn't think I'd ask you this early because we're going to try to avoid gluten later. But if we've had it, if we think we may have it, so we've reduced our diet the other way and we're going in to get tested and the doctor says, make sure you're eating gluten. We're going to talk about the foods that don't have it later. Mm -hmm. What do I want to load up on to, to make right. sure that I'm being tested properly? So if you're going in for your tests, you know, uh, the wheat, the barley, the rye, those are going to be things. So basically almost any type of bread on shelves, unless it's specifically marked gluten-free, mm -hmm. crackers, so, you know, your Triscuits, your wheat thins, those types of things, um, tortillas, most, you know, wheat tortillas, so those are things that are all, you're guaranteed they're going to contain gluten. Okay. We'll be coming back to that uh, shortly and more with Molly in just a moment. Um, with the testing, I go in for my annual test. I get a blood test. They're looking for a whole lot of other things, cholesterol. They're not looking for gluten. That's a specific test for gluten, right? So I'm not getting that as part of the annual checkup. That's correct. Okay. As common as this is between gluten sensitivity and celiac disease, uh, it would be great if we could just test everybody as they walk into the doctor's office, but we're not. And, and there are specific tests that need to be done, so you need to ask specifically for those tests. Okay. Dr. Ray's brought along some images. We told you about uh, some of the things we've been talking tonight. We're going to show you what celiac disease looks like, and we'll start right here. This is the small intestine, doctor? That's right. So when we were talking about the testing for celiac disease, I talked about the blood test, but the way to confirm your diagnosis uh, if you're suspicious for celiac disease is actually taking a biopsy or a sampling of the small intestine. And these pictures are your small intestine, which are just past your stomach. So when your food leaves the stomach, it goes into the small intestine to be uh, absorbed and uh, further broken down. And you have folds in your small intestine, which is where this work happens. Now, if you have abnormalities of these folds, or what we call scalloping of the folds, that's very classic for celiac disease. Let's show the next image here, doctor. This is what a normal small, the, um, these uh, villi, is that what these are called? Right, so these are the villi. So when I do an upper endoscopy test and I take a biopsy of your small intestine, that biopsy gets sent over to the pathologist to look at under the microscope. And a normal small intestine will have what we call villi. And you can think of these as fingers of your small intestine. And these fingers are where your small intestine grabs the nutrition that your body needs to function. And when your fingers are long and smooth and working well, you're in good health. But when you have celiac disease, 
the inflammation that's induced from gluten actually causes these fingers to shrivel up and flatten. And that's what you have on this next slide. This is a slide of celiac disease where those fingers are no longer seen. The small intestine can't absorb what it needs to to work. And you've got some inflammatory cells in there as well. All right, and let's take a look, doctor, at the um, skin condition you were talking, uh, talking about as well. That's right, so this is dermatitis herpetiformis, the rash that you can get on your uh, knees, elbows, or on your butt, and it, it, it's itchy, and, uh, and this is just a, a picture of the blistering appearance that it can have. And how is this uh, skin rash is treated? It's treated with, with the gluten-free diet. So once you start eliminating gluten from your diet, you will start seeing the rash resolve on its own. Okay, and let's talk about other uh, treatments. Um, tell us, doctor, that there's a pill out there. Tell us, doctor, that there's a shot. Tell us there's a surgery, but you can't tell us that, can you? I, I wish I could, and maybe in five years when you invite me back to the show, <laughs> I'll come back with some good news. But uh, for right now, uh, there's not a pill that you can take for this, and there's not a procedure that you can have to get rid of celiac disease. Uh, the most important thing is really sticking to the gluten-free diet. Now, there are a lot of people who are working on a pill, something to break down gluten, and there's also some talk of a vaccination in the works uh, where you might be able to tolerate gluten after taking the vaccine, but we're still a few years away from some of those things. What would the doctor of a celiac patient uh, be watching for? Um, other things that, that, could, that could go wrong. That's right, so there are, are a number of things that we need to watch out for. When you can't absorb your calcium and your vitamin D, your bones aren't as strong as they could be, so we need to really check for osteoporosis or weakening of the bones. Uh, we also need to check your blood counts to make sure that you are not anemic from the loss of iron absorption. And then we need to check your liver enzymes periodically to make sure that they're not going up from the gluten as well. Uh, uh, in addition to this, we need to check all your different vitamin levels, uh, and uh, we can supplement these uh, with, with a multivitamin to make sure that you're getting everything that you need. And interesting to know, you said there is an increased risk, at least uh, small test, small bowel, uh, bowel uh, uh, cancer, right, in some cases. That's correct. So people who have celiac disease and may not know it and are not following the gluten-free diet are at slightly increased risk for developing cancers of the small intestine, and in particular one called T-cell lymphoma, uh, which can be deadly. So if you are suspicious that you may have celiac disease, the sooner you know, the better, so that you can get on that gluten-free diet and reduce your chance of developing these cancers. And in addition to this, if you don't go on a gluten-free diet, you're gonna suffer from malnutrition and possibly also repeated infections. So this is definitely something that you wanna to try to get diagnosed as soon as possible. One thing you wanted to discuss uh, with our viewers uh, tonight, people watching, is um, enzyme therapy. That's something we're hearing about now and something you're hearing about, but you're not fully convinced yet at this point and neither is the FDA, right? That's right. There, there are some over-the-counter uh, pills, or if you go on the internet like everyone's doing nowadays, uh, I, I've found one called the glute enzyme, which uh, supposedly breaks down the gluten. But I think as long as your small intestine is getting exposed to gluten, you're going to have some inflammatory reaction to it. So I don't think we can trust these enzymes quite yet. If they make you feel better, that's great, but it's still very important to stick to the gluten-free diet as much as you can. And en engineered, uh, food engineers, are they working on uh, uh a solution? Right, so the uh, gluten that we have now is uh, very different from uh, what they had before when they first started developing uh, wheat and grain uh, agriculturally. Uh, so obviously the next step in that is trying to engineer uh, gluten-free wheat, but I think that we're still a few steps away from that being uh, a safe alternative. Okay. We're talking uh, tonight with Dr. Arna Bray, gastroenterologist and registered dietitian Molly Kimball, and now we turn our attention uh, to Molly and really want to get both of your thoughts on this. Um, it, it, we're all hearing about gluten now, um, but how long has it been around? Uh, is this a, a new fad that we're, we're talking about? Is there more focus on it? Is that's why we're hearing more about it now? And Dr. Ray, you said actually it's been around for a long, long time. That, that's right. So uh, we used to be hunter-gatherers and we used to eat meat and then we started developing uh, wheat as our agricultural prowess improved. Uh, so gluten has been around for uh, thousands of years. 
But we didn't start suspecting that gluten within wheat could be a problem until the last hundred years or so. And uh, it wasn't actually until this century, uh, one of the pediatricians in Europe who was taking care of uh, children who uh, were uh, refugees in World War II uh, started discovering the link uh, that when these children who were suffering from celiac disease did not have bread, they actually started getting a lot better in terms of their symptoms. And then when the allies dropped off uh, bread to them and they started eating bread and uh, other gluten-containing foods, their symptoms got worse. So that's when you started becoming suspicious that gluten was the problem. And then uh, a decade or two later, we actually confirmed that. Everybody's got questions for Molly. Molly, is, and I've got, I've got questions too. But before I get to them, is this something you're hearing more focus on these days? Yeah, so we're definitely hearing more focus on it. Um, I think it's something that, it's also important to note that gluten is not bad. You know, gluten is actually, can have its benefit. Um, different high protein cereals, high protein breads, the way that they're making these cereals or breads high protein is to add gluten to them. So for someone who's not gluten sensitive, gluten intolerant, or has celiac, Gluten's fine for most of us, so we got to make sure we're not making gluten to, out to be the bad guy here, you know. But I think people think that it's bad because when we see a product labeled as no sugar added or fat free, well, that must mean that the sugar is bad, which of course we don't want added sugar. But something gluten free doesn't necessarily mean this product is good, and it also doesn't necessarily mean that that gluten is bad. You said gluten is being added. Is gluten nat naturally occurring? Right, or can right. it be engineered as well and then added? Right, yeah. so like what Dr. Ray said is gluten is what, if you, if you have dough and you imagine you're making bread and you have that, gluten is what gives dough that stretchy property. So gluten is naturally occurring in wheat, barley, and rye, but gluten as an isolated protein, because it has, actually is a protein, can be added to foods to help either enhance the texture or to boost the protein content. Okay, how can we tell just by looking at a label, if we can, if a gluten-free food is a healthy Option. Well, the first thing is when you're looking at a label to decide is that if, if I am celiac or gluten sensitive, is this product even gluten free? And, if, and so many products now are jumping on the bandwagon that almost all of them, if they're gluten free, it's probably going to say it somewhere on the label, you know. Um, but there's a lot of things, you know, we were talking earlier, the wheat, the barley, uh, the rye, these are things that naturally contain gluten. So those are the obvious when you have your whole wheat bread or your wheat crackers, it's going to have gluten in there. But there's some things that there might be sneaky sources of gluten in there, um, salad dressings, you know, ketchup, seasonings and all. But the biggest thing is to realize that when you see that gluten-free label on a product, that product might not be nutritious. So we've got to turn it over and look at the ingredients and see, yeah, it might not have gluten in it, but what does it have and are these healthful ingredients? You know, it's all about the marketing. So have you seen foods trying to get people's attention by labeling them as gluten-free? but they never had gluten in, in them oh, to yes. start. Oh, yes. Oh, gosh. Yeah. And, and you're looking at them as a yes. dietitian going, why yes. would you even put gluten-free? Right, right. So you so are seeing some exactly. of that. Exactly. Um, yeah, there's some, you know, if, it, if it's a nut butter, a peanut butter, that's just fresh ground peanuts, and it now has the gluten-free label on there. But the things I think that are hardest for the consumer to know is if we're looking at, you know, your breads and your pastas and things like that, that's almost always they're going to contain gluten, so we do need that big label on it to tell us if it is gluten-free. The problem is, though, a lot of those things, they're not whole grain. So we have the message that we've heard for years that we want to avoid white carbs. So we know that white flour is not good for us. If we see enriched wheat flour, that's just white flour. Gluten or not, gluten containing or not, it's not good for us. The problem is a lot of these gluten-free products, they're made with tapioca starch, potato starch, potato flour, white rice flour. There's nothing nutritious in those foods, yet people are loading up on them because they're labeled as gluten-free. Let's show that list again, uh, and if we could, that Molly was talking about salad dressings. Uh, the, uh, I, think the one, I think it was the one before this, the sneaky foods yes. that are going to have it that you might not think would right. contain gluten, but do, right? Right, so a lot of different seasonings, a lot of sauces, salad dressings, ketchup, soy sauce, um, bouillon, uh, rice mixes, a anything that's a boxed mix that has a seasoning blend through it, if it doesn't say gluten-free on it, I would contact the company and ask them, is this gluten containing, uh, before I would have it. So, but yeah, there's definitely a lot of sneaky sources of gluten, and it's not just easy enough to say, oh, it doesn't have, you know, whole wheat, 
you know, it's not whole wheat bread or pasta or something like that. But um, I think even more important that start looking at if it is gluten free, look at the ingredient list to see what it actually does have. All right, now we're jumping ahead just a little bit back to where we were, were supposed <laughs> to be. And this is the point we really want to hammer home tonight. Gluten free doesn't always mean healthy. Right. In fact, probably many, 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 cases many times it, do it doesn't. Right. right. And you've got that list again, mm -hmm. potato flour, tapioca, and so on and so forth. What are some of the gluten-free foods that are good for well, us and nutritious? I think this is a huge thing to note, you know, that if, you, if you're following a gluten-free diet, the things that you need to buy specialty products of are your pastas, your breads, your crackers, and things like that, because those do naturally contain gluten. But my gosh, think of all the foods that don't contain gluten, black beans, red beans, sweet potatoes, We've got a list quinoa. here to show people yeah. too. Yeah, so let's do it. These are just, there's just tons of things. You just, you know, as we always say, shop the perimeter of your store. That entire produce section is gluten-free for the most part, you know? So stick with your fresh produce. You're gonna have naturally gluten-free things. You're gonna have a better price point on that. You're not spending the extra money for something that's been prepackaged and marketed as, you know, being gluten-free. These are all things that are so easy using different flours. So when you're baking, instead of using the tapioca starch and just potato starch, use things like almond flour, coconut flour. Those are gluten-free, but you're also getting other health benefits from those flours, and they're not the white processed flours that the other things have. So have you seen produce yet that, that says gluten-free? <laughs> not yet, <laughs> but it's coming, it might be coming, coming to a grocery right? store soon. <laughs> um, is there a way by looking at a label to know if a gluten-free food is nutritious and good for us. So that's where, you know, we that marketing is going to be on the front of the label. It's going to have that big banner, gluten-free. They're going to try to get your attention. Don't stop there, though. So what we have here, this is a brand called Glutino, and they have gluten-free crackers. And pretty much their entire line, with maybe a few exceptions, most of it is just going to be white processed flours. And so this is an example that I would say, turn this box over. So let's look at the ingredient list and see what's in it. The first ingredient, cornstarch followed by rice flour. We've got modified cornstarch in there, some salt. So, and when we look here- But I see organic. That, that's got to be <laughs> good, good. You know what, that's <laughs> My son a really would good tell point. Me that, right? The organic palm oil doesn't turn, that doesn't turn the corner for me any more than regular palm oil. <laughs> I but got we you. look here and the fiber is zero. So we've got zero grams of fiber here. We've just basically got 140 calories of white carbs in this product. So this is what I would say, uh, what not to do. Uh, now tell me what to do if All I right. want crackers and so gluten-free crackers. This next product is called Mary's Gone Crackers, which I love the name as much as I love the product mm -hmm. here. But Mary's Gone Crackers has these little cracker rounds, and basically they're quinoa, they're brown rice, they're flaxseed. So there's no white flour at all in these crackers, but they're actually truly a gluten-free cracker that is truly also 100% whole grains and seeds. And so when we look here, we've got three grams of fiber, three grams of protein. And again, when we look at that ingredient list, all whole grains, nuts, and seeds there. And it looked like a macaroon. <laughs> and I'm sure those probably aren't too good for you. I don't think it tastes like a macaroon. <laughs> don't sure don't go does. into it thinking I'm that. Sure it does. So this is one of your favorites. Yes. Give, give me some other that we don't have pictures for, but that when people say, hey, make some recommendations for me, because I, I have to be gluten-free, but I also at least want to try to eat healthy. Yeah, so there's a lot. I would say, you know, um, there's a, a chip that I love that's, uh, you know, most chips, so pita chips, something like Stacy's pita chips. They're not nutritious anyway, they're just white flour, but they're also gluten containing. So if you say, you know, I've had my pita chip that I'm dipping into my hummus, what would be an alternative? I love, there's a cracker called, I mean a chip called Beanitos. It's a black bean chip, they come in flavors like chipotle and nacho cheese, but it's a black bean chip, truly high fiber, high protein, and it's gluten free. So I think that's kind of what we try to do is find things that are gonna satisfy that craving, but they're also giving you something nutritious as well. Okay, not necessarily nutritious, but important for gluten free. Uh, Molly gave me just before the program started a list of products. Uh, I think Oxner has a uh, well developed relationship with Rouse's, and right. I know you do too. Um, so, where can people go to get this list of? Maybe some of the things on here may be nutritious, but they're certainly not all right. nutritious. Fiddle faddle is on here, <laughs> right. raisinets and snow caps. So this is a list so. that um, that Rouse's has that has their gluten-free products in there. And we actually added it to our website. It's ashner.org backslash eat fit. And we have a lot of different information on there. But one of the things is the uh, we have actually a Rouse's has a shop fit, eat fit grocery list that actually is all nutritious um, brand specific gro grocery items that they carry. But we also have the gluten free specific. And as I was looking at that one closer today and saw what you just mentioned, what we're putting on our list is going to have 
something that merges the two, a shop fit, eat fit list that's also gluten free. It's going to be a much shorter list, but you'll also know that those brand specific products that you're getting are also going to be good for you and gluten free. That's the one I'll be looking yes. for. Of course, then I'll go back to the other one, <laughs> actually, by, by the ones I'm probably not supposed to. Our guests tonight are gastroenter uh, gastroenterologist Arna Bray and registered dietitian Molly Kimball. Good conversation tonight and time to bring you into it. Our phone number is 5048. Uh, 504 866 3200. 504 866 3200. You can also send us questions by email at hhquestions at wlae.com. We're going to take a break and come back with your questions. You're watching Hello Health on WLAE. We can beat this. The spill in the Gulf is a catastrophe. But we will solve it. This is not a Gulf Coast issue. This is a national problem that requires a national solution. But what can you do to help? What do you have to offer? Your voice. Speak up. Add your name to the petition demanding restoration and protection of America's Gulf Coast. Sign it. Share it. Be the one. Be the one. RestoreTheGulf.com. Families come in all sizes and shapes. Sometimes your friends are your family by choice, or sometimes you're just stuck with Uncle Charles. But what we know is that you want to protect the people that are close to you. But the flu can unravel everything. Your flu vaccine protects you and your family. No matter what draws your family together, protect yourself, protect your family. Everyone needs a flu vaccine. And welcome back to Hello Health on WLAE. Tonight we're talking about celiac disease with two guests, registered dietitian Molly Kimball and gastroenterologist Arna Bray. You can ask your question right now by calling us at 504-866-3200. That's 504-866-3200. And we're taking email questions tonight too at hhquestions at WLAE. Dot com. Great to have you with us on the program. Let's start with line six where Rudy is holding, calling us from Metairie tonight. Rudy, welcome. You're on Hello Health. Yes, thank you for giving me a chance to talk. You're very welcome. I'll give you a quick uh, a thumbnail of my uh, condition. Please do. I'm 85 years old. I normally weighed about 165, 170. Presently, I weigh 125. Wow. I have a bad case of alopecia. I also have tremendous amount of flatulence. And I've been to a gastroenterologist. He did the endoscope uh, south and endoscope north. And he tells me that I'm not sensitive to celiac uh, or gluten. Where do I go from here? I've been trying everything in the world that I could think of, but uh, I can't think of anything that seems to help. Let's turn to Dr. Ray and see what advice he might have for you. Ray, uh, Rudy, excuse me. Rudy, thank you so much for your call. And uh, what, what I would ask the doctor, or I would make sure from the doctor, was that he took enough biopsies from your small intestine uh, to definitely confirm it, you need to take at least six to really do a good test for celiac disease. And some doctors don't know that. Uh, so we need to make sure that he took enough of them, that you were actually eating some gluten-containing foods when you were tested. And also, it's possible every now and then to miss the, bi to miss the diagnosis on the biopsy. So I would double check and make sure that you got all of the blood testing uh, to definitely confirm that you don't have celiac disease. Now, if all of those things were done properly and you definitely don't have celiac disease, although those are a lot of the symptoms that can go along with it, I would definitely do, uh, 
follow up with the doctor to do another level of testing and he may want to consider other things such as uh, a CT scan or some more blood work. Yeah, Rudy, what are some other, obviously you don't know, you haven't met Rudy, you haven't looked at any of the tests, what are some other possibilities of things that maybe Rudy's going through? Well, you what, know, what, what else might you be looking for if you ruled out celiac disease based on the symptoms he described? That's right. So, you know, we uh, worry about possibly a cancer or a growth in another part of the body, which could be causing weight loss. And there could also be other inflammatory conditions of the small intestine other than celiac disease, uh, such as uh, Crohn's disease, uh, which can also cause weight loss and uh, gastrointestinal problems. Okay. Rudy, thank you for calling tonight and sharing your story, and uh, good luck uh, with, with your condition. By the way, feel free, even if you don't have a question and just want to share your story, your gluten story and celiac disease story, we'd be more than happy to listen tonight. It might be helpful to other people watching. Let's go to line two, where Mary is calling us from Metairie this evening. Mary, welcome to Hello Health. Hello. Yes, good evening. Go right ahead. Yes, I just wanted to know, um, uh, thank you for, for having me to call. Uh, I just wanted to uh, find out, do people, can people have sores or lesions in their mouth from this, from this disease? Mary, thanks so much for calling. Uh, you can have lesions in your mouth uh, from celiac disease. It's certainly not out of the realm of possibility, but there are also a, a number of other uh, illnesses that can also cause mouth lesions. And again, the most common one is actually Crohn's disease, which can cause uh, some uh, uh, mouth sores. So if you are having mouth sores that aren't going away and you don't have a reason for it, it's certainly very reasonable to get tested, at least with the blood test for celiac disease. Okay. Mary, thank you for calling. We have another line, uh, Mary calling us on line three this evening. This Mary's calling us from Gretna tonight. Mary, you're on Hello Health. Welcome. Uh, yes, I was diagnosed with uh, just the beginning part of the gluten-free problem. I had a rash all over my body, my thighs, my arms, and they were uh, continuously giving me cortisone to use as a cream. And I finally went to a dermatologist in New Orleans, and he checked me over and he says, I bet you have the beginning of a gluten type allergy. So he put me on a gluten diet for two weeks. And by the time I went back to his office, I didn't have any more rashes and I didn't need any other precaution except to follow a gluten diet. But my, what I'm calling tonight, when you, uh, with the holidays, I'm still not sure of what alcoholic beverages you can actually have to drink like uh you know like i used to drink scotch but i understand i can't drink scotch i can drink vodka uh or what type of alcoholic beverages for the holidays i was concerned as far as some of the beers Good question. We haven't talked about it yet tonight, yeah. but you're exactly right. And usually when we have Molly on, it's right around the holidays right, anyway. Right. Molly, did you want to jump in here? Well, there, you know, beer is definitely one that I would steer clear of. There's a few, um, I'm blanking on the name, it's either Red Bridge or Red Hook. Uh, it's not Red Hook, it's Red Bridge. There's only a handful of gluten-free beers, and that's something that I don't see them at most regular grocery stores. So if you went to a, you know, a, a Dornax or a Martin, someone who specializes in that, um, I'm so sorry that I'm blanking on the name of this, but it is like a Red Bridge, I believe is what it is. And um, But if you look for it online, you can find it, and if you don't see it in your stores, ask them to carry it, because of course other people are going to be wanting that as well. Not Red Stripe. It's not my, Red my, Stripe my and it's not Red Hook. <laughs> you just disappointed my director. Gosh, I, I want to say it's Red Bridge, but, there, but almost every beer is going to be gluten-containing. So unless you're, if you're going to parties, bring your own beer <laughs> for that. It has nothing so that to do know. with the alcohol, right? It, so it's right. not alcoholic, uh, alcohol-free beer. Right, because most beer is going to be brewed with barley and these types of That's things, right. and so it's going to be gluten-containing. What about wine? Wine is going to be pretty much gluten-free. Um, the, the different liquors, though, can vary as far as their gluten content. That's right. The liquors can be a little bit tricky. And from what I understand, the, the distilled liquors are typically safe and gluten-free. But again, you're going to want to uh, check the label and make sure that it's not gluten-containing. And 
if there's really any question remaining, you can always just call the manufacturer and say, is there gluten in your drink? It can be hard to tell sometimes, but some of the, uh, the, the dark liquors or the ones which are malted or, or have coloring to it, a lot of times those can be dangerous and have gluten uh, infused yeah, into point. them. Good point. A lot of the malted beverages will, but I think if you're a good, a good rule of thumb might be to stick with your clear, uh, clear liquors, but still, if you're going to have this type of a clear liquor, I think like Dr. Ray said, I would call the company and say, hey, is your product gluten-free? Have your own gluten-free beers, and then for the most part with red wine, white wine, you'll be safe there. All right. Cheers, Mary, and, uh, <laughs> and Merry Christmas to you. Let's go to line four where Sunita is calling us this evening. Sunita, you're on Hello Health. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, this question is for Dr. Ray. Uh, I hear so much about this gluten every day nowadays. Uh, I just wanted to know, can this allergy come to you at any time of your life? And how do you find out to ask the doctor, I want to do, I could have a gluten allergy. What kind of symptoms that makes you ask the doctor to do a gluten test? All right. Sunita, thank you so much for calling, and I think I know who that is. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, thank you so much for your question. Um, so, so we're saying, um, you know, what, what can prompt you to, uh, to get the testing for celiac disease and, uh, and see if you need to be off of, uh, off of gluten? And like I said, it can be almost anything. If you're having abdominal pains that don't have uh, an explanation, if you're having extra gas, if you're having changes in your bowel habits outside of what is regular for you, it's absolutely reasonable to, to get tested for celiac disease. And uh, what I would say is if you have the suspicion, I would start off with just getting the simple blood tests. And the ones that we mentioned earlier in the uh, uh, show are the TTG, or the tissue transglutaminase, and checking an IgA level. And you can start from there, and if there's any question that it may be positive, then proceed on with the endoscopy test. And she was wondering too, can you get it, can, can an elderly person develop it all of a sudden? Yes. That, uh, so I forgot about that part of the question, and that's uh, definitely true. You can get it in childhood, or I've found some people who are over 50 who get the diagnosis made later on in life. Sometimes you can have the predisposition genetically, but it doesn't show up until you have some sort of illness or infection, and that's what brings it out. Okay. And Molly, you, we have confirmation on the name of the beer? Redbridge. It is Redbridge. So Red, thanks Red to Red your producers Red. for the research behind the scenes. Glu Gluten-free. <laughs> Gluten-free. And there's, there's several others, but that's the most common one that I've seen, and that's where if you go into your store and ask them to carry it, they probably can get it for you. Uh, yeah, have you had it? Can you, can you? you know, I haven't tasted it, but okay. clients of mine who have, I've not had any negative feedback on it. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Let's go to Louise, who's calling us on line five this evening. Louise, you're on with Dr. Arna Bray and registered dietitian Molly Kimball. Welcome. Hi, um, I have a few questions about the celiac disease. Uh, I was diagnosed with a fatty liver from an ultrasound, and I was wondering if that had anything to do with gluten. That's a great question, uh, Louise. Thanks for asking. Um, I think we're still learning a lot about fatty liver and what exactly causes it. At this point in time, I don't know that we can necessarily point to a direct connection between gluten intake and fatty liver. Now, uh, Molly can back this up. A lot of people will find that when they go on a gluten-free diet, they actually start losing a little bit of weight because they're eating healthier than they were before and, uh, and they're eating healthier in general. So your fatty liver may actually improve when going on a gluten-free diet. But I can't say for sure that gluten is causing the fatty liver 100%. But you're not ready to d dismiss the correlation either? Not, no, not yet. I think we still have a lot to learn about gluten and its effects on the body. So, so I, don't, I don't think we know 100% yet, but it's certainly possible. Molly, any thoughts? No, no I, I agree completely with what you said. I think that it's not something that we've seen a direct correlation, and it's not something that would um, be a red flag for me to say for someone to go and you know, get checked for celiac, but I think you can't rule it out. You know? And, and Louise, one more thing. Uh, if they have detected fatty liver because your liver enzymes were elevated uh, and they did an ultrasound which showed fatty liver, 
it's still very reasonable to check, ask them to check for the celiac testing to make sure that that's not what was contributing to your liver enzymes being elevated. Louise, you said you had a couple of questions. Was there anything else you wanted to ask tonight? It wasn't from my liver enzymes. It was actually from an ultrasound. Okay. And was there anything else, Louise, you wanted to, to chat about tonight? Uh, yeah. What doctor would you go to for fatty liver? I've been to like seven different doctors, and everybody says just take vitamin E and Lipitor. And since you were a gastroenterologist, I said, well, you know, when I was watching, I said, well, let me call and see if it's celiac or something else, you know, or maybe you could give me some direction to go in. Right. So the first part of your question, which doctor would you go to for fatty liver, uh, the specific uh, specialty is a hepatologist. So a lot of gastroenterologists will do both gastroenterology and hepatologist. But a hepatologist is a doctor who specializes just on liver diseases. Uh, and, and in auctioner we have uh, people who uh, practice just hepatology. Uh, so that's the first part of the question. And then uh, the second part, uh, if, uh, if the liver enzymes were normal, but you, ha um, but you have fatty liver, uh, you know, it, it's still reasonable to, to check for it, and you can do that again with a simple blood test. Uh, was there another part of the question also? No, I think that was good. Where she would, would you go to a, spe a hepatologist or would you go to uh, a gastroenterologist based on what she's described? For, for the fatty liver, I would probably see a hepatologist um, and, and get their opinion. And the treatments that you mentioned with, with, with the Lipitor and, and the vitamins, those are uh, pretty much the, the standard treatments at this time. Now again, in a few years, we may start having some other new medications and pills to help treat fatty liver specifically. But right now, it's simply that and weight loss if you're over your ideal body weight. All right, Louise, thank you for your questions tonight and for watching. Let's go to line one. Chris is next. Chris, you're on Hello Health. Hey, how are y'all doing? Great, good. very good. Hey, I wanted to thank y'all for doing this show, and thank you, Dr. Dr. Ray. You've done an excellent presentation. Thank and you. hello, Molly. I read you every week in oh, the TV. Thanks. Uh, I just wanted to say I've been on a gluten-free diet for five years. Um, initially, I was tested. I had the blood test. However, I had been on a gluten-free diet. Um, I am IgA deficient, and all of my blood tests came out negative, as did my endoscopy and, and uh, uh, some other testing. Uh, I did have the genetic testing where I tested positive uh, for, for one of them. It was inconclusive. However, after going on the gluten-free diet, um, I had previously had horrible IBD. I've had a horrible bloating. I'm 60 years old, but I look like I was expecting any day. <laughs> and within days, uh, the IBD and the bloating went away. So further down the line, uh, all of my, most of my health improved dramatically. So after that, I. Uh, decided to to research uh, celiac and gluten non celiac gluten sensitivity, and I found that just avoiding gluten, whether you test positive for celiac or not, can make a tremendous difference in one's health. Um, so I, I just my question is, why is there a hard and fast rule that if you test negative for celiac, that does not mean that you have to avoid gluten. Well, I think, you know, we were saying earlier kind of the stats here. So um, an estimated 1% of the population are diagnosed or have celiac, you know, official celiac. But, you know, 10% or more of the population fall exactly into this category that you're talking about, where they're gluten intolerant or gluten sensitive but they don't meet that specific criteria, that that's that diagnosable criteria for celiac. But all of us in the medical profession are realizing that more and more and more, it doesn't matter if you don't have, if you don't have celiac, we still need to press the issue further and see if you're gluten sensitive. So I'm glad that you kind of took it into your own hands, made those changes yourself, and you're reaping the benefits from it. I think that's fabulous. And Molly, just to add on to that, 
I think I would, I would admit that our tests for celiac disease are not 100%. So you may have celiac disease and you may fall into that one to three percent where the test comes, at, comes out wrong. And it's certainly, like you mentioned, not, it's worth repeating when you're on this uh, gluten-containing diet, which can be hard sometimes. I definitely understand that. I have a few patients who uh, tell me, I can't do gluten for more than a few days. And we don't know the right answer as to how long do you have to be on that gluten-free, that gluten-containing diet before you need to get tested again. But we think it needs to be at least about two weeks. But um, I am a firm believer that there is non-celiac gluten sensitivity like you referred to, and maybe in a few years we'll be able to discover that blood test which will help pick up those people. We just don't have it right now. Chris, thank you so much for calling and for sharing your story, and it sounds like it's working yeah. for you, and if it's working for you, keep on rolling. Let's go to line two, where Arthur's calling us from Laplace this evening. Arthur, welcome to Hello Health. Good to have you. Yeah, how you doing? Fine, good evening. I need to find out about my, uh, I just, the doctor just put me on a, bowl. I'm like a risk, not a, bowl. I'm not diabetic, but I'm a risk of diabetes. And uh, he wants me to cut the carbs and sugars and all that. So what is a good plan to use to, uh, so I can follow it, I guess, to eat all the kind of different kind of types of foods and everything, or what I can have, or what I can't have, or uh, stuff like that. Well, the good news is that after all this very specific gluten branding and all this, you know, these sneaky sources of gluten, when you think about cutting back your carbs, it sounds just an awful lot easier, you know, doing that. But, but your, your doctor is right that if you're, you know, borderline diabetic or, you know, pushing the, the line on type 2 diabetes, the, the most important thing is to dial back on that carbohydrate intake. So your body's not able to process those carbohydrates, so let's don't overload your, your insulin levels, let's don't overload your pancreas with it. So I would say, you know, keeping the emphasis on what you can have, tons of, you know, if you've got all of your non-starchy vegetables, your lean proteins, your healthy fats, your avocados, olive oils, nuts, seeds, those are all the things that we can have. And I would pull back on the pastas, the rice, potatoes, breads, crackers, um, those, even those things when they're whole grain are high in carbs. So dialing it back on those, not m maybe having none, but really scaling down your portions on those, and beverages. So sugared soft drinks, but even realizing that fruit juice um, has just as much sugar ounce per ounce as soft drinks. So really pulling back on those things, refining those no calorie replacements for those beverages, but keeping the emphasis on lean proteins, veggies, those healthy fats, and then some fresh fruits in there as well. So what is he drinking? No, no soft drinks? Stay right. away from fruit juices, probably. Right. So there's, um, depending on if someone likes carbonation, there are a lot of different carbonated alternatives. Um, there's sparkling waters, but there's things like LaCroix that are naturally flavored, zero calories, but zero artificial sweeteners, Three ninety nine for a 12-pack. And you can get them at places like Kmart. So there's a lot of no-calorie options out there for beverages that it's going from regular vitamin water, makes the switch to vitamin water zero. So looking for things that have zero sugar, zero carbs, and zero calories on those beverages is going to be a huge way to cut those carbs from your diet. Very good. We hope that information helps. Let's go to line three. Pia calling us from Metairie this evening. Pia, welcome. You're on Hello Health with Dr. Arna Bray and Molly Kimball. Hello, Pia, are you there? Nope, looks like we've lost Pia. We do have an email. Pia, if you have a moment, call back. We're running short of time, but let's go to an email we received. Can my PCP order the celiac disease testing or do I need to see a gastroenterologist? Dr. Ray? It's a great question. Uh, your PCP can order the initial primary test. Primary care physician. We right, right. Pri so your primary care physician can order the uh, blood test for celiac disease. Uh, there is actually something called a celiac panel, uh, which they can order, which has most of the standard tests for celiac disease. Uh, but if they don't know or, uh, or are not sure about which tests to order, uh, they can certainly call one of us and we will be happy to tell them or we can order it ourselves. But to confirm the diagnosis, if the test does come up positive, you do need to see a gastroenterologist to consider getting the upper endoscopy test. Okay. Let's go to another uh, email uh, question. Does gluten sensitivity or celiac disease predispose you to other gastro issues such as Crohn's disease? And we've touched on that uh, tonight. I think we're learning more and more about the connections between gluten and celiac and the rest of your body, and it can certainly affect all aspects of your body. I don't think that gluten intolerance or celiac disease 
can lead to Crohn's disease, but a lot of patients with Crohn's disease actually feel a lot better when they're on a gluten-free diet. Now, there is one other disease called microscopic colitis, and if you've been diagnosed with this, there is an association definitely with celiac disease. So if your microscopic colitis has not gotten better, you need to try a gluten-free diet and to be checked for celiac disease to make sure that those two are not uh, together. Okay, and we do have one, uh, looks like a final caller as we run short of time here tonight. Deborah has been holding. Deborah, welcome to Hello Health. Yes, good evening. Um, I was wondering if there's a significant positive correlation between headaches and celiac disease or gluten intolerance. I think that headaches are definitely listed as one of the possible uh, side effects from gluten uh, intake when you're gluten intolerant or have celiac disease. A lot of people that I uh, find with celiac disease complain of this brain fog. They just feel like they're just not quite right, they're not thinking clearly, and then and headaches can certainly go along with that. So if you're having headaches and you haven't found an explanation for it yet, trying a gluten-free diet and sticking to it 100% is certainly a very uh, reasonable thing to try or just to go ahead and get tested to see if you are positive. Good question. Thanks for asking it. Another email question, uh, Molly and Dr. Ray. Would the elimination of sugar from your diet as well as gluten improve your symptoms or is it just elimination of gluten? I would say, you know, um, sugar is very inflammatory and, and so celiac is inflammatory. So if you're having some of these inflammatory um, side effects like Dr. Ray mentioned, limiting your sugar intake absolutely could help with those. And, and I would say added sugar there, so not necessarily milk sugars or fruit sugars, but our honey, agave, raw sugar, turbinado, cane sugar, all of these. Dr. Wright, anything mm -hmm. to add there? I agree with that 100%. Okay, and Molly, I know before we go, you wanted to give a shout out to someone who you work very closely yes. uh, to, uh, with, about some, you know, specializing in this particular area. Yes, so we have um, our, one of our registered dietitians who works with us, Alexis Wallbacker over at Elmwood Fitness Center. She's who sees all of our gluten-free clients. So if you need a gluten-free diet, she's in it all day, every day. She really specializes in it, stays current on what stores carry what products, what brands. So she's just a real wealth of knowledge there. And so if you were interested in scheduling an appointment with Alexis, just call our front desk at Elmwood Fitness Center on, um, in, out in Clearview on, uh, on Clearview Park way. Front desk, ask for Alexis, our nutrition department, and she can get you set up. So she's just, anytime that we get a phone call for a gluten-free diet, we steer them straight to her. But if I see you at the grocery store, I can still ask you a question, as long as Always. it's quick and, <laughs> and, and you still have some place yeah. to go. And like we said, look for our Rouse's list, and we've got it on our list to do to kind of make a merge of our, our Shop Fit, Eat Fit, Healthy list that's also going to be gluten-free. So we'll hopefully have that up within the next month, have that kind of sifted through for us. All right, we'll look for Molly on WGNO, uh, staying skinny and healthy. <laughs> we'll be reading her in the Times-Picayune. And Dr. Ray, we look forward to inviting you back. We hope it's not five years. We hopefully, <laughs> hopefully sooner. And by then, we hope we have a pill or we hope we have uh, a surgery or an injection or something like that. Uh, actually, I don't hope we have any of those <laughs> things, but I hope we do have an answer uh, to this. And many people, it's just, I mean, that's the good news and the overriding theme of the night is you can have a disease but you can do something about it yes. that really refreshingly doesn't involve a pill or an injection or a surgery, right? right? It's just avoiding certain things in your diet. That's right. All right. Great to have both of you with us. Thank you for your work tonight and for your work in the Oxford Health System. Thank you, Molly. Thank you, Dr. Ray. Thanks for having Thanks. us. All right. Thanks for having us. Great program. Well, to make an appointment with any Oxner physician or to register for any of Oxner's Hello Health seminars, you can call Oxner at this number. In fact, you could get to the dietitian that Molly talked about uh, through this number as well. 504-842-5669. That's 842-5669. You can also get to Dr. Ray through that number. As a reminder, you can rewatch tonight's presentation or any of our Hello Health programs on our website at wlae.com or on Oxner's website at oxner.org. Just type Hello Health in the search areas and that'll get you started. Our thanks again to tonight's guest. Thanks to Humana and Oxner for making this program possible. And our final thanks, as always, is to you for your support of this program, Hello Health, and our station, WLAE. Good night.
LAE has been presented by the Oxner Health System. 850 physicians and 90 medical specialties working with a team of more than 13,000 employees provide nationally recognized health care across Southeast Louisiana. Oxner, health care with peace of mind. I call it my one less thing to worry about plan. With a Humana Medicare Advantage health plan, I get more clear information about my options with 24-hour access to my Humana, my secure website, and I can get help every step of the way from a Humana Market Point representative. More of what you want because you deserve more. 